Hello and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know, a classical podcast by classical educators. And you know what, Hannenberg? Because you have been so critical of my intros, <laughs> I actually wrote down an introduction on paper. What? <clears throat> oh, my word. Hello. Welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know. Classical Stuff You Should Know is a podcast. Classical Stuff You Should Know is good. Classical Stuff You Should Know is a very, very, very cool <laughs> and wonderful podcast of learning. Classical stuff you should know is what we are going to do now. Hannenberg, how is my writing? You, you thought <laughs> this would make me less critical <laughs> somehow? Did, did, did you think that that was a well-crafted piece of uh, prose? I can't say I did. I can't say I did. Oh, man. If there was only a way oh, that I oh could learn God. to make a well-crafted piece of prose, I would... I would listen to that <laughs> if it existed. What am I to do? Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> Thanks for that segue. Uh, all right, so today... <laughs> you sound defeated right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm just so sad. We didn't even mention who we are. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so my name is Graham Donaldson. And I'm a classical educator at Veritas Academy in Austin, Texas. And I am joined today with Thomas Magby. Hello. Who is the Dean of Fun. <laughs> and yep. with A.J. Hannenberg. That's right. Lord Arthur Jan Hannenberg. Yes. The um, second. The second. Is that true? My grandpa was named Arthur. Oh. I don't know. Can I count myself as the second if he wasn't a lord? Oh. Yes, you can. I feel like, yes. Yeah, you can. Because you're a lord mm -hmm. after you're born. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm Lord Arthur the mm -hmm. second. Yeah. Back, in, back in, sec in second grade, I would put Thomas Fletcher Magby the second on the top of my papers, but I'm not actually the second. I just like the title. What my is... grandpa was, was named Arthur, and we called him Art, and then that went to Artie, and then Artie Farty. <laughs> oh, and it's just a progression, and that's why I went by AJ's. You don't ever want to be, <laughs> like, you're going to be Artie Farty. There's no way around it. So what is your heraldry? Are you a baron? No, are you a... Uh, of, of Sealand? I'm a, I'm a lord. You but can actually buy a buy barony a or... Be a count, but Count Hannenberg doesn't yeah. sound good. Sounds Neither like does Baron. Okay, Lord Hannenberg. Lord sounds Hannenberg. Good. All right, so then, yeah. okay, cool. But like, uh, one of our students was going to get it, and he, Baron sounds better with it. Uh, all right, so anyway, <laughs> uh, today we are talking about writing, and <laughs> it's a, a slight departure from classicism a oh, little no. bit. I don't think so. Sort of, but here's the thing. I've, I've done a lot of studying about, or at least tr my best attempt at trying to find good style manuals from back in the day. And from what I can tell, the great majority of writing instruction comes in the form of the pro gymnasmata. Mm -hmm. You guys heard of the pro gymnasmata? Yeah. Yeah, it's like um, they have memberships that you can join <laughs> at the beginning of every, like in January. They have like discounts. It's a, it's a wine club. It's a wine. No, I'm just kidding. It's, it's a gym, isn't it? The, the Pro Gym Nismata was a... This episode sponsored by? ...was a series of exercises that you would go through every year as you got your education. So it's a series of, I think, 13 or 14 exercises. You start with a fable, and then you have to write, like, a praise of somebody and then, you know, condemn someone or praise an act. Like, And it talks about how to do these each of these things. And it gives specific prescriptions. Like, if I'm going to quote someone, I have to tell you who they are. I have to praise that person. I have to say the quote. And then I have to say how the quote applies to my life. And they go, and that's useful, right? It's useful in that it gives you a format. Can I but, ask a dumb question? Yeah. I always think of it as a speaking exercise, but is there also, like, um, didn't you take stories and then, like, memorize the stories and then tell those stories? Or are they actually writing their own stuff as they're going through it? They're, they're, these are writing your own stuff. Okay. These are all original things. Okay. I think the, maybe it was like a retelling of a story. You I might think there's one where you got translation. Like, like Aesop's fable. I don't, I, I don't know. No, you're writing your own fable. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I, I tried this with my students. I did not find it that beneficial. It's, it's great if we can spend more time on it, but it just ended up being this quick thing that was, we, you know, and it's supposed to be like coincide with your age as you grow. And so having ninth right. graders write a fable, not very helpful. Wouldn't be helpful for you as listeners. There's really no point to sending you there. So I've been looking for a classical way to teach writing, or at least how to teach just writing well. One of the things that I, you know, realized after I left college was that I'd I'd been taught the five paragraph essay, but that was almost it. The rest of my writing instruction came from just mimicking the people that I had read. And to be fair, that's a good way to learn to write is just read a ton and then do what they do. But you can get better through actual focused effort and learning what great writers have said about these things and finding a style manual. So the five canons of rhetoric are invention, arrangement, style, memory, and delivery. Memory and delivery are important if you're gonna speak it. 
But writing is those first three. So invention, thinking of things to say, arrangement, putting them in a sensible order, and then style, making them sound good, are all things you can do with practice. Uh, invention, we already did one on the logical fallacies, right? And we also did common topics. We also mm -hmm. did common topics. So that's all invention. And then arrangement mm -hmm. is we did one mm -hmm. on classical rhetorical form. That's arrangement. But it doesn't have to be classical rhetorical form. A lot of the ancient writers wrote in what was called a chiasm, where the it would slowly ramp up to a main point dead in the middle and then kind of slowly ramp down from there. And the beginning would mirror the end and it would sort of be a mirror, mirror each other all the way. Mm -hmm. So my intro would be mirrored by a conclusion. And, you know, as I ramped into my main point, I would also ramp out of it in ways that mirrored each other. So that was... So arrangement is pick a structure and yeah, stick to it. pick a structure. And... The, the tough one, the one that I never really learned was style, hmm. how to make my sentences sound good. How, how exactly do I construct a paragraph? How exactly do I not make myself sound terrible? Mm -hmm. And these things are taught, like there are manuals that tell you how to do this. And so today we are talking about how to write well, how to make good sentences on paper. Mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and I've sort of compiled some things here, but the first thing I wanna do is is point you to one of my favorite things on writing. And it's by a guy named Mark Twain. You might have heard of him. Yeah. And it's it's one of his lesser known writings. He actually wrote some stuff that, you know, wasn't quite as popular. I mentioned a couple of podcasts ago uh, a book called A Tennessee Yankee in King Arthur's Court. I read it this summer. It was great. But here's one that's nonfiction. And he's writing about another writer. It's called Fenimore Cooper's Literary Offenses. Fenimore, James Fenimore Cooper was the guy who wrote Last of the Mohicans. He wrote the Deerslayer series. He wrote a few other things. And That he's, sounds hardcore. Deerslayer? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Book? And it was all these Wild West tales. And he's still read, to be clear. Like, mm. James Fenimore Cooper is not some guy that has sort of disappeared in time. Like, Last of the Mohicans was a movie that came right. out in the 90s. It's a great movie. Yeah. Soundtrack. That is, mm, you gotta get pumped up to do something. Listen to the Last Mohican soundtrack. You'll but, you'll bust through a wall. But yeah. Mark Twain would not have approved. Maybe of the film. Oh, he didn't approve <laughs> of the writing. Good. So I'm gonna read you a little bit of the beginning because he gives some some clues for writing, and then a little bit of the end, just because it's awesome. And I recommend you as a reader go read this thing. It is one of the best instances of how to properly roast someone I have ever heard in my life. So he starts with. Do you want me to hum the last of the Mohicans theme song in the <laughs> back when while you read maybe, it? Maybe, maybe at the end, not at the beginning. <laughs> okay. So what he does first is he quotes three other professors. So and I quote: <clears throat> "The Pathfinder and the Deerslayer tale stand at the head of Cooper's novels as artistic creations. There are others of his works which contain parts as perfect uh, as are to be found in these, and scenes even more thrilling. Not one can be compared with either of them as a finished whole. The defects in both of these tales are comparatively slight." They were pure works of art. That's Professor wow. Lounsbury. High praise. Uh, high praise. The next guy. The five tales reveal an extraordinary fullness of invention. One of the very greatest characters in fiction, Natty Bumpo, <laughs> the craft of the woodsman, the tricks of the trapper, all the delicate arts of the forest were familiar to the Cooper from his youth up. That's Professor Matthews. And lastly, Wilkie Collins, another famous writer. Cooper is the greatest artist in the domain of ran romantic fiction in America. And now Twain begins his <laughs> article. It seems to me that it was far from right for the professor of English literature at Yale, the professor of English literature in Columbia, and Wilkie Collins to deliver opinions on Cooper's literature without having read some of it. <laughs> it would have been much more decorous to keep silent and let persons talk who have read Cooper. And then he begins his next, next paragraph. Cooper's art has some defects. In one place in Deerslayer and the restricted space of two-thirds of a page, Cooper has scored 114 offenses against literary art out of a possible 115. <laughs> it breaks the record. There are 19 <laughs> rules governing literary art in the domain of romantic fiction. Some say 22. In Deerslayer, Cooper violated 18 of them. The 18 require. And so he's, he's going to list some rules for writing, which are good for you as a reader, but... Uh, they're more focused on narrative, and my, the rules I'm going to go over today are focused for either narrative mm. or nonfiction. Uh, but here are his rules. The tale shall accomplish something and arrive somewhere, but the Deerslayer tale accomplishes nothing and arrives in air. <laughs> Number two, they require that the episodes in a tale shall be necessary parts of the tale and shall help to develop it. But as the Deerslayer tale is not a tale and accomplishes nothing and arrives nowhere, the episodes have no rightful place in the work since there was nothing for them to develop. Number three, 
They require the, that the personages in the tale shall be alive, except in the case of corpses, <laughs> and that each and that always the reader shall be able to tell the corpses from the others. But this detail has often been overlooked in the Deerslayer tale. Number four. They require that the personages in a tale, both dead and alive, shall exhibit a sufficient excuse for being there. But this detail has also been overlooked in the Deerslayer tale. Number five. They require uh, that the person... Uh, sorry. A, an update just popped up on my computer. Number five, th- they require uh, that the pers- that the personages of a tale uh, deal in conversation. The talk shall sound like human talk and be t- such talk as human beings would be likely to talk in the given circumstances and have a discoverable meaning, also a discoverable purpose, and, sh- and a show of relevancy and remain in the neighborhood of the subject at hand and be interesting to the reader and help out the tale and stop when the people cannot think of anything more to say. But this requirement has been ignored from the beginning to, of the Deerslayer tale to the end of it. Uh, and then he, he goes on for a few more. Uh, m- one of my favorites is number seven. They require that when a personage, is, a personage talks like an Ill- illustrated gilt-edged tree calf hand-tooled $7 friendship's offering in the beginning of a paragraph, he shall um, not talk like a minstrel by the end of it. But this rule is flung down and danced upon in the Deerslayer tale. <laughs> uh, at the end, 12 through 18 are quick. In addition to these large rules, there are some little ones. These require that the author shall say what he is proposing to say, not merely come near it. Use the right word, not its second cousin. Eschew surplusage. (laughs) Not omit necessary details. Avoid slovenliness of form. Use good grammar and employ a simple and straightforward style. And those will actually come up today. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to talk about those a little bit today. And then he goes on a really long diatribe about how the invention is terrible and all of his characters do miracles and can see flies at 150 yards and shoot them with rifles, and it's all ridiculous. And then I'm going to jump all the way to the bottom now. Uh, I may be mistaken, but it doesn't seem to me that the Deerslayer... Uh, it does seem to me that the Deerslayer is not a work of art in any sense. It does seem to me that it is destitute of every detail that goes to the making of a work of art. In truth, it seems to me that the Deerslayer is just simply a literary delirium tre- tremens. A work of art? It has no invention. It has no order, system, sequence, or result. It has no lifelikeness, no thrill, no stir, no seeming of reality. Its characters are confusedly drawn, and their acts and word by their acts and words prove that they are not the sort of people the author claims that they are. Its humor is pathetic. Its pathos is funny. Its conversations are, oh, indescribable. Its love scenes odious. Its English a crime against the language. <laughs> Counting these out, what's left is art. I think we must all admit that. <laughs> it is, oh man, it's a joy to read. So good. Yeah, you should go read it as a, as a listener. It's fantastic. Uh, and I found a website that has compiled some of. Have Twain's. you read the Deer Slayer? Have you read it to see if it's as bad as he says? I have not. Uh, <laughs> you don't want to after reading no. that. Yeah, uh, partially because of that, and partially out of a a strangely misplaced loyalty to Twain. If Twain hated this guy, I really love <laughs> Twain, so I'm like choosing sides, even though both men are dead and don't care if I like one or the other. It's just funny because in Constellations of Illiteracy, the author, so the author of that original essay that Shaw was writing about, like also had this deep love of Mark Twain. Um, and like the more she read, she's like, there's always going to be more Mark Twain for me to read. So I don't know. It's cool that you have that love too. I have never read Mark Twain. I know. It's just, I mean, it's a blind spot in Canada. Tom Sawyer I guess. And yeah, never had to read him. And, okay. Weird. All right. We're Northerners. Yeah. You're wrong. Oh. That's fine. I mean, it's <laughs> okay, so I'll come back to Mark Twain. He has some rules for writing that were compiled from a few different sources. You can find them online. But today, I'm going to be using uh, two sources that I have sort of, after fishing through some books and heeding some recommendations, come across. One is called The Elements of Style. It is by a couple of fellows, Strunk and White. And it is a, wow, distilled compendium of how to write well. The thing is probably as thick as seven dimes stacked on top of each other. It's just not thick at all. It's really And I, really I bought a copy from Half Price Books a few weeks ago, and it was $3. Yeah. So you can find it on Amazon, Amazon for like, for like three a bucks. buck. Yeah. And it is, I've, I've read some other books on like how to write well. I think 
On Writing Well is one of the more recent ones that they've been using in colleges and stuff. Mm-hmm. And Sincer, Will Sincer, is that him? Yeah. yeah. And he he says that every good writer should read Strunk and White all the way through once a year. Yep. Right. So it's not just some book I cooked up. This is widely renowned as one of the better style manuals. Strunk was the professor and White was a student of his and he compiled Strunk's lecture notes essentially into a writing manual. And it's old. Like I think <clears throat> Strunk I think he the White was in Strunk's class in like 1913. Mm. So it is a it is a something that's been around for a while and it is a delight. Yeah, it it really is good. I mean, it's not exactly It's like a field manual. Yeah, it's like a field manual. So it's, 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 it's a not, little dry. Because I know you don't like on writing well for the advice it gives, but on writing well is is pretty easy to read. Isn't yeah, on writing well is really easy to read, but I I feel like I'm wading through a bunch of stuff to get to the good stuff that Strunk and White tells me in half a page. Yeah. yeah, and then if if Strunk and White is the espresso, then Prose Style by Stone and Bell is the latte. Right? It's a it's a little easier to read. It's oh, okay. more like on writing well. It's mm-hmm. not as you know as straight to the brain as the Strunk and White is. The fun thing about Pro style is that oh, I love it. <clears throat> it was clearly written in the '60s mm-hmm. to kids that were like stick it, sticking it to the man the counter, riding the, motorcycles. Like, the counterculture of California. Counterculture. <laughs> it's like so. I hear you want to stick it to the man, but have you thought about sticking it to the man with proper rhetoric? <laughs> yeah, it's so, it, is, <laughs> it is really really entertaining. All of the student examples they use are students who are like talking about protests in Vietnam and. Free love and oh, it's fantastic, but, but it's still good. It, like, oh, it's, oh, it's great. it is incredible. It would be like if we wrote a modern style guide and it was like, we're talking about hashtag memes, hashtag yeah. write well, <laughs> and it was like, yeah, we did memes yeah. and so we'd be embarrassed and we'd be eye rolling, we'd be rolling our eyes and embarrassed of it in like five years. Yeah. And I'm sure, um, Bell and what's his name, um, uh, Stone, Stone and Bell yeah. probably look at like. Looked at it in the 1980s, and they're like, oh, man. <laughs> what are we doing? What are we doing? I really wish they would give a modern revision of it, because it, it is a really good manual of it's style. Good. It's good. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I've tried to... And I, have, I feel like I can stick it to the man very well now. <laughs> because yeah. of, because I, of it. I, I, it's so sticky. It's oh, a, there we go. the stickiest. All right, number one. <laughs> uh, so Sorry, I've, I've sort of compiled a list of rules, and oh, bless you know, you, just what everybody needs when writing is another yeah. list of rules. But I've put together some rules, and I, I will jump back and, tween, uh, back and forth between these books to give you good examples. You guys might have to help me out. Um, and I'll try to go through them quickly, but here they are. So seven decent rules for writing from both Stone and Bell and Strunk and White. So four guys between two good. books all together. And these... The clickbaitiest <laughs> yes, podcast exactly. we've ever had. It really seven is. Decent <laughs> but these writing. are, yeah. yeah, seven decent rules for writing. But as far as I can tell, these are n- rules that every good writer would agree with. They're ubiquitous. Most style manuals I've seen agree with all of these. I've never seen someone argue with one of these rules, but rather they're just confirmed again and again. Are these two books organized by, like, a list of rules? Like, do they have a hundred rules in each one and you're picking the best from each of them? No. So the... The Strunk and White begins with basic, like, here's how to do grammar function. Mm-hmm. And then the second piece is principles of composition, and that's what I'm walking you through. And then the last bit is misused words and expressions. <laughs> and then a... Delightful yeah, to go through. Yeah. it is. And then an approach to style, like, here should be your writing process. Like, yeah. number one, place yourself in the background. Number two, write in a way that comes naturally. Number three, work from a suitable design. So that is, like, how you should go about the writing process. And then there's an afterward. So it's cool. really, it's pretty brief. The misuse things are like, when do you use although and when do you use however? Mm. Like, or oh gosh, or uh, one that I see often mixed up is fewer versus less. Mm. Yep. So you use fewer when it's a countable item. Mm-hmm. You can have fewer golf balls, mm-hmm. but you cannot have less golf balls. You cannot have fewer salad, but you can have less salad. You can have less, less ketchup. Water. But you less have fewer ketchup. bottles of ketchup. ketchup. Yeah. Exactly. I cannot have less bottles of ketchup. So mm-hmm. fewer versus less is one of those things that's often misused. Uh, Strunk and White begins with uh, logic and evidence. Mm. So they say, here is how to collect yourself. They actually start with the logical fallacies and walk you through thinking clearly, because if you don't have good thoughts, you can't write anything good about them. Then it talks about tone, and then it moves into like progressively smaller bits of writing. So it goes paragraphs, sentences, words, and then talks about mere writing versus good prose, grammar, syntax, orthography, punctuation, Research and note taking, like it really is exhaustive. And this stuff, do you teach the kids this stuff? Like, do you read it with some of your students? Is I that- so I try to distill these into exercises they do in writing lab cool. that f- deal with little pieces of it. Cool. I would love for them to have this and just walk through it during their 
time here at Veritas, but yeah. I'm, you know, we're still rev revising the curriculum. Sure. Okay, so to the rules. Number one, it's one of the more boring ones, but use the active voice. Now this includes a little bit of grammar, but the passive voice is when the the subject of the sentence is the thing being acted upon, not the thing doing the action. So, but the active voice is something I don't want to do. Oh my word! <laughs> <laughs> so verse. So for example, my first visit to Boston will always be remembered by me. So the visit to Boston is the thing being remembered by something else. This is worse than. I shall always remember my first visit to Boston. And you can feel it. Like, even as a listener, you can feel the difference in those two sentences. Mm -hmm. One is a little heftier. It's more straightforward. It's easier to understand. Here's a, another version. Um, or let's let's do this. I will give you guys the bad version, mm -hmm. and then you guys try to give me the good version. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, let's do this. Show. Yeah. You guys ready for this? I feel like I'm going to lose against the English Okay, teacher. Let's go, Banger. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's time. <laughs> yeah, Bangers are known for their quality of writing. Yeah. There were a great number of dead leaves lying on the ground. A number of dead leaves were lying on the ground. A gr yeah. Dead leaves lay on the ground. Dead leaves cover the ground. Yeah. Gr because Grams was more concise, oh. I'm going to give oh. him the point. He's going to win every one of these. I mean, so. yeah. I also teach this book, so How I, about, I know all these examples. examples. <laughs> oh, I'm messed up. How about at dawn, the crowing of a rooster could be heard? The rooster crowed the at rooster dawn. Crowed. There you go. The reason he left college was that his health became impaired. I want to give you one. I want to give you one. Go for it. Do you know um, all these? Uh, what was the sentence? Uh... The reason he left college was that his health became impaired. Yeah, health impaired his presence at college or something like that. Sure, you can do that. Uh, so those are all good examples mm -hmm. of... Do they provide both? But, okay. Yeah, they give me both. Is there ever a, a time when passive voice is useful or stylistically uh, acceptable? I can think of two instances. Uh, one instance is scientific writing. Because mm. you, as the actor, as the scientist, are usually withheld from the experiment, right? The mixture was heated to such and such degree. It then... You know, the mixture was mixed with this. You don't matter in that case. In fact, you are supposed to be as... Like, Objective and background as possible. Yeah, you're, you are not supposed to be there if you can swing it. <laughs> like if, if we could do science without people... A lot of our would, students even be uh, think that when they go to science class. If I didn't have to be here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So in that case, passive voice is good. Or if you want to keep the actor obscure. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes, I, think, I find that students use this when they're trying to sound dramatic. Mm -hmm. The table was set. The silverware was placed, placed. next to the plates. Yeah, yeah. Right? Instead of saying the the servants had set out the silverware and set the table. Right? Mm. Because they are trying to focus on the objects, like there are some instances where passive voice is okay, mm. but the majority of the time, I'd say probably ninety-five percent of the time, active voice is better than passive voice. Right? The sentence, his face was punched by me, is far worse than I punched Punch him in the face. mouth. Yeah. Right? And I find that students will will go to the passive voice when they are unsure of the things they're saying. Yes. Or if, if they're if they're sort of if they're a little if they themselves are nervous about the declarations that they are making, mm. they will soften it by going to the passive voice. Yeah, and that's the thing is the passive voice softens your writing, right? And it's it's not a good, definite, strong assertion. It's sort of like this thing was acted upon by another thing, mm. rather than this did this. Now, do you think? I mean, I it's a rule. I don't know. I'm just thinking of. If there are probably times where you want to soften your writing, or yeah. if you are like consoling somebody mm -hmm. in your speech, I don't know. I could see how the passive voice would probably be. So this one is simply a preference. Yeah, yeah. Like mm -hmm. prefer the active to the passive if if possible, right? Some mm -hmm. of these rules have exceptions mm -hmm. in writing. You know, once you've mastered the rules, you can find instances where you need to break them, right? You sh just like in military endeavors, you don't want to be breaking the rules of engagement because you're ignorant of mm -hmm. them. You might break yeah, some yeah. rules about how people typically do war to take advantage, mm -hmm. but you would never do it because it's accidental, right? You don't want to be that kind of commander. The same is true in writing. Okay, rule number two. And the stakes are as high. <laughs> <laughs> well, the pen is mightier. Right? <laughs> okay, the the next one is only found in Strunk and White. It is not in Stone and Bell, but it is put statements in positive form. Hmm. Make definite assertions, avoid tame non-committal language. So, the reason we put statements in positive form, and what I mean is rather than saying, like, I'm I'm not tired, you rather put it positively. I'm I exhausted. Am, I am wired. I'm awake. I'm alert. Mm -hmm. I am ready to go. I, I'm about to, I'm as, like, 
electric as a lightning bolt, right? Those are all stronger than saying, I'm not tired. And the reasoning for this is a logical one, Hmm. right? If I say, I am not A, I am leaving open a whole bunch of other possibilities, right? If I say, I'm not tired, it could be that I'm just... You're kind of groggy. I'm Mm. a little groggy, or maybe I'm feeling completely normal. Maybe I've had 35 cups of coffee and I'm literally bursting at the seams, right? It's not a definite assertion. Because you've negated something, you've left it indefinite, right? I don't hate it. Well, do you love it? I mean, you don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you love like it? it? Do you feel indifferent about it? Do yeah. you just weirdly dislike it? You're leaving a lot of options open. And so when you use positive form, you are making a more definite assertion about what's going on. I love it more than coffee. Mm. Yeah. Okay. See, there you go. Uh, for, I don't, though. Whatever it is, I, whatever it is, apart from Amanda, I don't love it more than coffee. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So some examples. He was not very often on time, opposed mm. to he usually came late, or he was usually late. How about, she did not think that studying Latin was a sensible way to use one's time. She thought studying Latin was a waste of time. Yeah, that's exactly the literal wording, so point, Magby. Aha, we're tied. Here, yeah. Here's one of my favorite. And remember, so this is tied, not just putting things in positive form, but making definite, firm assertions, not tame, non-committal language, like mediating it with maybes and cans mm. and sometimes, right? That's kind of a way to hedge your bets and avoid being argued with. When you write, you want to be... Definite. Yeah. Is this where your hatred of amplifiers fits in? Oh, uh, amplifiers comes a little later. Okay. We'll, we'll I'm get there. very, very excited. <laughs> oh my word! Uh, oh. All right. So here, here's a good example. This is the the poor version. Very. The taming of the shrew is rather weak in spots. Shakespeare does not portray Catherine as a very admirable character, nor does Bianca remain long in memory as an important character in Shakespeare's works. So if we take those in pieces, right, the Taming of the Shrew is rather weak in spots. Taming of the Shrew is bad. Yeah, you could say Taming of the Shrew is bad or make a definite assertion about why it's bad. Shakespeare does not portray Catherine as a very admirable character. I'm not saying much there, Mm -mm. right? Very admirable. Is she she kind of admirable? I'm just, I'm not being definite. Now, the opposing version is far better and it also has the bonus of being short. The women in the Taming of the Shrew are unattractive. (laughs) Catherine is disagreeable. Bianca insignificant. Mm. There you go. And you can feel the weight of mm-hmm. those, right? Yeah. Calling someone disagreeable, calling Bianca insignificant is far more weighty than saying Catherine is not very admirable and Bianca doesn't stick in the memory. Right? It's 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 just a firmer way of saying something. Yeah. And you'll find this kind of hedging of bets present in a lot of business communication and a lot of I was literally just thinking about that. Just that um <clears throat> I, we would used to have like a form of bingo um, when bankers would talk to each other of like words that don't mean anything that you would just throw in. So like people would say at the end of the day a lot to add credibility to a thing, even though there's no evidence in that. When you're asked if a thing is a good investment or not, well, there are headwinds and tailwinds. But like, at the end of the day, <laughs> at the end of the day, end, we're long-term yeah. investors, and you know whatever you want to do, it's like well, okay, so you don't know and you don't liquidity. have liquidity. Yeah. <laughs> right, so. Headwinds, tailwinds, but at the end of the day, liquidity. Liquidity. <laughs> A synergy, so was, really. Yeah, I just thought that. Yeah, um, well, but that's rewarded yeah. in uh, businesses because when you are um, like that, you aren't. You can't be wrong because sure. you never made a definitive statement. Obfuscation is the it's realm of the scoundrel. Yeah. Oh, Ooh, yeah. It's <laughs> the way to seem credible when you don't actually know what you're talking about. Yeah. And it's the way for like what I usually find this in student writing when they haven't thoroughly thought through what they want to say. Yeah. And so it comes out as half baked because they don't want to make an assertion that yeah. they could be wrong. wrong about. And then I could call them and be like, that didn't actually happen in the yeah. book. Yeah. This isn't actually true. They yes. said, I said, maybe. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> Yes, you said maybe because you don't actually know. And the other thing is I found that a poor vocabulary also leads to these um, oh. non-assertive phrases. They don't know the actual word. So it's easier to say less than memorable if you can't come up with the word insignificant. Or mm. forgettable. Yeah, or forgettable. Yeah. That's right. And I, can't, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of vocabulary, mm. right? Any reader of... 1984 will know that like Double. as you no, have you, you read it yeah are you talking about the speak stuff or, uh, or even, speak. Um, it's called speak. and they instead of having um good better best it's good more good and most good. no good plus good and that's double it. plus that's good yeah, yeah. and their goal in deleting words is to take away from you the notion of rebellion yeah. by removing the word rebellion yeah if i cannot talk about rebellion i can't do it, it. Yeah. right and and so the, as we lose words we lose the ideas behind the words mm-hmm. is is kind of his you know, supposition. Fun fact, this is why it is called the liberal arts is because it frees us by giving us more. Mm. Like by, by learning, like for example, um, a student is trapped 
in their own mind if they do not have the rhetoric or the mm-hmm. vocabulary to express themselves. Yeah. And they feel it. You know that feeling you've had when you just can't get the word. You're like, I can't. What's the word for? Oh, and you get frustrated. If that, if you can't get the word for anything, it is just constant frustration. Yeah. yeah, and I think Mark Twain's roast of Fenimore Cooper is actually a good demonstration of this, right? If you don't have the right vocabulary, the best you can say is his writing is lame, mm-hmm. rather than saying, I can pick out the specific defects in his art and yeah. call it, like, one of my favorites is that right at the beginning he says, James's, uh, what is it, his gifts in invention were not <clears throat> substantial, but what he does have he exercises well. It's actually quite cute. And it's just this <laughs> scathing in, in invective about how he comes up with stuff to, stay, to say. And Mark Twain couldn't have done that without the words that he has. Yeah. Okay, so put them in positive form. This comes with a couple caveats. So you can uh, not is the, the, the word there that doesn't necessarily help. It's better to express even a negative in positive form. So not honest is better as dishonest not important as trifling, did not remember, forgot, did not pay attention to as ignored, and did not have much confidence in as distrusted. So it's not don't use negative words, it's use the specific word you mean, not it's not a positive thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Like what that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, interesting. Yeah. Okay. And, and even these negatives are kind of in po- positive po- in po- yeah. form, right? Because Rather than not. negating yep. a, a word, you are having a word not that honest. is honest. You have a word that actually it means a dishonest. Thing. Yeah, means a specific thing. And another thing is that placing a negative in juxtaposition with a positive usually ends up strong. So not charity, but justice. Mm-hmm. Or an example from Shakespeare, not that I loved Caesar less, but that I loved Rome more. Mm. So showing them the negative and then giving the positive, as long as you have that positive there, you're not falling into the trap of obfuscation. Mm. You're giving a definite, but you're juxtaposing it for even stronger construction. So, I'm sorry I called you a scoundrel. <laughs> I, I left that world, so okay, right. I, I, I no longer am a scoundrel. Is that, how, is that all you have to do? Change job and then yep. you're, okay. you're yeah, okay. your sins are forgiven. Oh, yeah, wow. <laughs> I think there you go. Okay, uh, so first rule: use active voice. Second rule: put statements in positive form. Use definite assertions. Avoid tame, non-committal language. Don't use cans and maybes and mites and mays. If you really have something to say, right? If you are actually unsure, you can use those. But if you think you know, just stink and say, say it. it. Yeah. Um, people are going to argue with you one way or the other, so you might as well make your stance strong. Yeah. All right. Rule number three: use definite, specific, concrete language. And I think this is one of the things that takes Twain's writing and puts it above others. Hmm. And it does the same thing for Chesterton and Lewis. These guys were really good at this. And what I mean is that they avoid general, vague an abstract in favor of concrete, real things. Oh, read the Bible. Read the. Uh, oh, I'm, read the New Testament. I'm uh, definitely Testament. going to read that example. Wait, okay. What? You'll read it. Okay. So, for example, th- these are simple juxtapositions. Um, a period of unfavorable weather set in. Okay. It was a dark and stormy okay. night. Yeah. Versus, it rained every day for a week. So right? when you know exactly what's happening. Yeah. In the second one, I know exactly what's happening, and it wasn't. Like the first one sounds fancier. Mm-hmm. It sounds we call it fine writing, mm-hmm. right? People or academic writing or academic mm-hmm. writing. They tend this way because it sounds so high high flown. Mm-hmm. But in fact, it's much harder to understand. People don't easily get it, and I don't know why we tend this way in academia when it's much easier to say just it rained every day for a week yeah. rather than a period of unfavorable weather <laughs> set in. How about he showed satisfaction as he took possession of his well earned reward? Sounds very fancy. What in the world does it mean? It means. Yeah. yeah. How about he grinned as he pocketed the coin? There you go. Yeah. Yeah. He smiled as he stuck something in his pocket. It's way easier to understand. Um, let me, here, here are a couple more examples. Uh, this is one of the better ones. In proportion, and this is on the left, would be the kind of writing you find in academic writing. And I, I know I'm saying something kind of controversial here. And... I think the reason academic writing tends this way is because it deals with abstractions. It deals with ideas. And getting your point across using concretes is far more difficult than just yeah. dealing in the abstractions, right? This kind of you writing... You figure out what you're saying, right? Right. It's yeah. hard. It is a hard kind of writing. Yeah. Uh, and see, if, if I'm thinking through the ways that C.S. Lewis does this, he will deal in the abstractions and then give you a concrete picture of it right next to it. Yeah. Um, so, an example... In proportion as the manners, customs, and amusements of a nation are cruel and barbarous, the regulations of its penal code will be severe. Huh. So if 
if we're a barbarous nation that likes our manners and customs are barbarous and cruel, then the penal code will also be severe. So we'll do cruel things. Sure. Here, here's a concrete version. It says the same thing, but it's much easier to understand. In proportion, as men delight in battles, mm. bullfights, and combats of gladiators, they will punish by hanging, burning, and the rack. Yeah. Imagery. Say, using imagery to get it across is a lot more helpful than using, like, sort of academic buzzwords. Yeah. And the academic buzzwords, really what they serve to do is just drain writing of its blood, right? But it's, it, but it, it feels like it should be more profound. Like because, it, it, because it's, it's um, I don't know, maybe because like you're using a word as opposed to an image. Maybe the, people feel, feel like you're smart? using an image. Yeah. You're being sort of like, I don't know, a showman. Because yeah, the other one feels more showy. Yeah. And that's kind of the point, though. You want to show. Well, yeah. you, you, can, you communicate more by showing than by... And, and again, I'll bring up that example of I was working in a student's thesis and she wanted to say that putting a doctor in judgment of other doctors will give him more time as a judge rather than being under scrutiny. And you can say it in a big high flutin way or just say this way he spends more time on the judge's bench than in the defendant's dock, right? And that is a, That's you it. know, it communicates everything. It yep. communicates everything you need to communicate. It's much shorter. It doesn't use high, hard to understand words. Like we're humans. Mm -hmm. We deal in concretes better than we deal in abstracts. And so if you can figure out a way to say it concretely, it's better. And here are some more examples. Um, other lessons were absorbed through his experiences versus he learned even more from talking to the lumberjacks. Right, right. How about attitudes and opinions resulted from these environmental occurrences versus all he knew about Glasgow was that he could see from his window and what his nurses told him. That's good. There's no way to overcome the situation of racial relationships versus tensions between whites and blacks are inevitable in a mixed neighborhood, right? And this is, again, from Stone and Bell, so there's a, there's a lot of stuff about race in here. Um, but, uh, like, those are really good examples of going from highfalutin academia to decent, easy-to-understand concretes. And here's my favorite example. Um, and this was... Orwell, who translated this, uh, yeah, George Orwell, who translated this passage from a Bible. So here mm. is Orwell's translated version. Drained of life and blood. But it sounds academic. And mm. so people people hear this and they want to write this way. And oh, it, listener, <laughs> if I can please convey don't. one notion to you, it's that please don't write like those really long articles that don't mm. say anything, right? Yeah. Sometimes people have to write things for a graduate program because they need to graduate. And so they use these big words, mm. don't mean anything without saying anything true or useful or concrete. But here, here's in my example. Objective consideration of contemporary phenomena compels the conclusion that success or failure in competitive activities exhibits no tendency to be commensurate with innate capacity, but that a considerable element of the unpredictable must inevitably be taken into account. What? Read it again, in the, uh, Thomas. See if you can come up with what Bible verse it is. I okay. have literally no idea. Okay. All right, Read it a little slower. A little slower. Objective consideration of contemporary phenomena compels the conclusion that success or failure in competitive activities exhibits no tendency to be commensurate with innate capacity, but that a considerable element of the unpredictable must all, must inevitably be taken into account. I have no I have no idea. What in the world? Read, all right. What's, How about this? Yeah. This is the actual passage from the King James. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle Are to you the strong. Me? Neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches of men, uh, riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Hey, that second one's a lot better. That's it's crazy. a thousand times yeah. better, but it's concrete, right? He just uses examples and the race to the swift, as opposed to competitive, competitive advantage. Yeah. So um, once again, let me read the the one drained of blood, and this is by, this is the kind of writing you hear in academia. Objective consideration of contemporary phenomena compels the conclusion that success or failure in competitive activities exhibits no tendency to be commensurate with innate capacity, but that a considerable element of the unpredictable must inevitably be taken into account. Mm. It's horrible. It is horrible. Yeah, but that's that seems to be what my students think they should write. But I'm wondering where that comes from, because, like, they ha have they been taught... Well, I mean, Veritas does not teach to write in that drained of life way. It doesn't. I, I, there's a, I have a couple of thoughts on that. I think one of them is the fact that when AJ read it, uh, Meg B, you said, wait, I didn't get that. And AJ said, let me read it slower to you. If you wrote that, you probably feel like 
oh, these idiots that just can't understand what I'm saying. Right. How about I dumb it down by slowing it down? Mm-hmm. So I feel like for the person who produces that, they think that they are amazing. Saying something, Saying something notable profound and profound and meaningful. And the fact that the rabble does mm. not comprehend it, yeah. again, just gives credence to the fact that I am brilliant. Yeah. When in reality, the writer needs to be like the servant of the rabble. Like yeah. He needs to be able, if you want to actually communicate what you want to say, you need to leave the impression. I think a lot of the reasons why people in academics write this kind of way is in many ways, they don't really care if someone gets what they say. Yeah. They're jumping through a hoop. Yeah. Or, or, it's, or, or they're trying to not get nailed to the wall if they were wrong, like in business meetings. Right. Yeah. And I don't know. I, I, I heard a quote, and I forget where. I think I was listening to a podcast, but it said, there is a type of smart person <clears throat> that can make simple things complex mm-hmm. when they are complex. There is another kind of smart person who makes very complex things simple. Mm -hmm. And I think it is the latter that is probably the more intelligent, right? You can take these complex ideas and distill them into easy to remember remember things. I still remember things from C.S. Lewis's essay, The Weight of Glory, because of the images. Do you guys remember the image about the boy playing with mud? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's the image? Uh, he's by the beach playing with mud pies instead of the, I'm sorry, instead of of the holiday at the sea. Do you remember what it was meant to illustrate? We are um, too easily satisfied. Um, we don't know what's offered to us. We yeah. have God and we amuse ourselves with lesser things. Yeah. Yeah. And if you go back and read that passage, you can see that he begins kind of with an abstract and then he takes it. He says, we fool about with drink and sex and all of these things because we don't, don't know really. what is offered. It is like a boy making mud pies because he doesn't, or in the slums because he doesn't know what is meant by a holiday at the sea. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's such a powerful image and everything that needs to be said is said mm-hmm. briefly and concretely and easily, right? You yeah. need to have faith in your reader that they can extrapolate a little bit from the concretes, right? I get the point of the King, King James passage. Mm-hmm. I don't need you to translate it into yeah. these ethereals. Yeah. Um, if you can kind of hide behind the writing, uh, it's kind of like a barrier for people to criticize your ideas. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's definitely a bit of a like emperor's uh, clothes thing going on. You don't want to be the person that says, I don't understand what you're saying because your writing is bad because everyone would be like, ooh, yeah. this guy doesn't understand the writing. Maybe he's not cut out for like big boy discussions. Yeah. And it's like, no, your writing's really bad. <laughs> I mean, like that is why Lewis is accessible to a ninth grader mm-hmm. and and it, and is sort of poignant because the writing is clear yeah. like that is a hard skill to take something like um, something that is obscure or difficult and boil it down to a concrete and a uh, digestible thing but what's weird is that it takes it takes good thought mm-hmm. and good writing to yeah. boil it down to an example rather than st- it's sticking in the ethereals right yeah. to connect that to the real world is hard but it's but Instead of actually explaining the idea, like you have to use a metaphor to mediate mm-hmm. between the two minds, like between my mind, which has an idea, and I want it to get to someone else. I don't know. For some reason, that it makes requires sense. wit. And what there I mean by is. wit is, it's like a wit is is um, uh, the ability to join things together that may not necessarily uh, obviously join together, yeah. and that is a skill of composition. Mm-hmm. Um, um, there is wit. What's the opposite of wit? The two skills. Oh, it's like uh, discernment, I think. Yeah. Judgment. judgment. It's wit and judgment. Wit and judgment. So That's knowing, mm-hmm. knowing what things are and then being able to find the... So one is like division mm-hmm. and then the other one is being able to see connections. So, yeah, seeing connections is, is and synthesis, I mean, it's a hard thing. I mean, there's probably lots we could say. We could probably say that we are living in a more judgmental culture than we are living in a conciliatory culture. And therefore, that comes out in our writing. We have a hard time taking abstract concepts and making them digestible to everybody else because we don't practice being conciliatory. We don't practice wit. We don't practice mm. putting things together. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Okay. Uh, that was numbers one through three. So use the active voice, put statements in positive form and commit. Don't, don't you know, avoid tame language. Three, use definite, specific, concrete language. Try not to deal in ethereals if you can help it. And number four... And I think this was best put by Twain because he does it in two words where everybody else does it in more. Eskew surplusage. Or in other words, <laughs> omit needless words, and that's drunk and white. And then the rule as given by Stone and Bell is prefer the shorter version to the longer. Right? So get rid of words that don't matter. And here are some examples. See if you can't delete some words for me, fellas. 
First one, it was clear to Havlicek, or Havlicek on what basis the request for his resigna- resignation had been made. The guy, whatever his name is, knew why he was, why he resigned? Is that, you said he's resigning? Yeah, Havlicek knew why they wanted him, him to resign. That, that's the better version. Number two, the fact that Susan had made up her mind to leave college was distressing her parents. Susan's parents were distressed by her leaving college. Yes, uh, or to put it in the active, Susan's decision to leave college distressed her parents. Yeah. Uh, this next one. As a result of the labor policies established by Bismarck, the working class in Germany was convinced that revolution was unnecessary for the attainment of its ends. Woof. I, yeah. Yeah, you guys might not have even caught that. So the better version is Big Bismarck's labor policies convinced the German working class that revolution was unnecessary. That's what I was going to say. Which is so much easier to understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Here, here's some more. There was nothing for Alice to do. Shorten it. There was, isn't it already pretty short? There was nothing for Alice to do. Alice, Alice did, was aimless. Alice did nothing. Alice was aimless. Alice had nothing to do is, an, is a better version. Banks in England are more helpful than banks in this country. English banks are superior. English banks are more helpful than ours is another version. Mm-hmm. Right. The idea sure. is to maintain the comparison if we Yeah, can. I guess, I mean, in my example, I was using sort of context, like assuming that I was talking previously about these banks in our country right. and then saying, but British banks are far superior. Mm. Yeah, how about, it is predicted in the report that many polluted lakes will be pollution-free by 1980. Polluted lake? Just that last part of the sentence? Yeah, the report predicts that many polluted lakes will be pollution-free by 1980. So, Hannenberg, when you teach this to your ninth graders, the problem that I've had when I talk about this with my 10th graders is the only message they hear is short sentences, Mm. and therefore they actually lose a lot of context and a lot of... So they're cutting the wrong thing. They're cutting the wrong thing. Huh. So how do you communicate that, like, it's not just, like, juvenile sentences that I want, but it's omit needless words. So I, uh, my practice is I have some complex sentences that have a bunch of extra, you know, stuff, wadding and padding. And then we go through and we delete and I say, you have to maintain the meaning mm-hmm. in this sentence. If meaning is lost, that is bad. And the way to do that is to have good vocabulary. You need to have one word that means six. And this is another instance where vocabulary is important. If I don't know the word aimless, which is the one you brought up, I would, I would have to still say Alice had nothing to do or Alice was without a goal, which is worse than the word she was aimless, yeah. right? Or she was, yeah. Okay, so here's here's some examples from Strunk and White. Um, well, so first it, it goes through a bunch of words that you can just safely, typically delete. Like, the question as to whether is just <laughs> whether. whether. Yeah. Uh, there is no doubt that should be doubtless. doubtless. Used for fuel purposes. Used fuel. for fuel. <laughs> he is a man who. A man. He. How about just he. he. Yeah. Right? He is a man who likes cake. He just likes say cake. he likes cake. Yeah. Uh, In a hasty manner, could be hastily, this is a subject that, or this this subject, right? This is a subject that confuses me. Just say, this confuses me. Um, Her story is a strange one. Her story is strange. The reason why is that, just say, because. because. Um, Another thing that Strunk and White harps on is the phrase, the fact that. Mm. It is... It doesn't mean anything, right? It doesn't mean anything. You can edit it out almost of almost every single sentence it appears in. So here are some examples they have. Owing to the fact that should be since. So owing to the fact that he was, he liked ladies, he used to hang out with the girls at the time. Just say, since he liked girls, he liked to hang out with girls. Mm-hmm. Uh, in spite of the fact that, you could use though or although. Call your attention to the fact that, say, remind you. How about the fact that I had arrived, you can just say, my arrival. The fact that I had arrived caused a stir. My arrival caused a stir, Mm -hmm. right? You can delete it from almost every sentence it's in. There is almost no reason to keep it. I'm just, I'm wondering now, are these mistakes sometimes like logical fallacies though, where they sound good to people hearing them? So the point before that people write this way because they think it sounds smarter. Well, then does it sound smarter to an audience listening? Like, yeah, is poor writing rewarded? You are, you are calling it a fact. But, but is that, um... If, it, if I tell an audience, the fact of the matter is X, like I'm priming them with fact and then when I'm telling them whether it's a fact or not, like yeah, it could I be mean, I'm writing, sh- but could, could it still work? It's like uh, shaky scaffolding, mm. right? I'm scaffolding my idea and, yeah. and then someone says, are you sure that's a fact? Can you prove it? Yeah. What's your source? And you just go, because <laughs> you just said it was a fact. And, but it's not. 
And and basically, you're saying at the end the of the day, Maggie. Of, at the end of the day, it's my least favorite phrase. I hate that phrase so much. <laughs> the I think the fact that the pe- reason people use it is because it's like an easy box. At the end of the day, the when fact I, of the matter is, you know, it's less like okay, you have said nothing. When I say the fact that my audience is primed, thinking, okay, there's a bucket. He's about to put something mm-hmm. in the bucket. That's an idea. Mm-hmm. The fact that I hadn't showered for a week. Okay, so I hear the fact that. Okay, here's the thing that he has, and then I. I <laughs> I come. I wait for the conclusion. Mm. When I could just say I hadn't showered for a week, so no one wanted to hang out with me. Right? I don't have to prime them with this bucket right. because the bucket doesn't actually accomplish anything. It's the idea in the bucket that matters. Yep. That's kind of how I think about it. There's a confidence and a swagger needed for making <coughs> definitive statements yes. that people are scared to do. Yes, and I'm still scared to do. I mean, it's like, yeah, it's uh, you are, yeah, you are putting something out there that is going to be questioned Mm -hmm. and it's a lot easier to hide it yes yeah all right so you can also usually get rid of who is or which was or that was like his cousin who is a member of the same firm just say his cousin a member of the same firm or trafalgar which was nelson nelson's last battle you can say trafalgar nelson's last battle the which was and who was and that was can usually just be cut Mm -hmm. right you can get rid of them and here is a lengthy example of a wordy kind of befuddled set and then that same thing pared down. Mm. And my students, I've kind of become notorious in ninth grade for being able to just cross stuff out. Like mm. they'll turn in these these papers that are, you know, just sort of laden with extra words and I can take what was a 20 word sentence and turn it to five. Mm. And it's because I think honestly it's, it's a lack of like clear definite thinking. Mm. They don't really know where the sentence is going and so there's a lot of extra words there to say something very simple and mm. plus they need to fill a few pages. Right. So, it, having page requirements oh, so good. So do you think oh. we do ourselves a disservice by, by saying this needs to be three pages long? That is why I never say it. Mm. I say, you need to write an essay about this that is five paragraphs. And they say, how long? And I say, as long as it needs to be. I tell them that the ontological argument, one of the greatest arguments ever in philosophy, was half a page. I don't think you can do that. Uh, Golden Mountain. So That's the ontological argument. Yeah, yeah so... But then why does the, the greatest thesis, thing that can be considered, whatever. So, why, so, but thesis has a requirement. It's a length requirement. It's a time requirement. Yeah. But 90% of the time, we find that what is actually, their, their difficulty is not finding material, but cutting material out. I'm just, yeah. The, Our, just to the other side of like, what if, if the requirement is you have to have three pages of well thought out material, like that proves a depth of knowledge of a book or a topic or whatever, as opposed to just fill three pages. And I know you would never say just, just fill three pages, but. I don't know. I kind of like the idea of I want a quality three pages. I don't know. I mean, like we we do give page requirements later, mm-hmm. but for my freshmen, I yeah. say you need to write well, and as long as that Before, takes you, it yeah takes you. I mean, and, and then, yeah, and then you expand the amount of quality <clears throat> thought, I guess, by sophomore. Yes, right. I mean that's the thing. Like when in ninth grade, tenth grade, even by the time they're eleventh and seniors, writing is so hard that. I would, I have a, my sort of dream is that every assignment, that they would just write perfect paragraphs. And if they could just write one paragraph that is very well thought out on a topic, like that is a much better exercise than if they have a five paragraph essay. I don't know, like, um, well, that's, that's why, anyway. our, why, that's mm-hmm. why thesis is so valuable, right? We, we do have a requirement, mm-hmm. but they turn it in. And if I cross out half the junk in your thesis, well, you still got six pages to yep. fill. Right? Mm-hmm. They go through exactly. they go through several iter- iterations, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna cross out stuff that doesn't matter. Yeah, um, and that's honestly what's my one of my favorite things. I love killing words and deleting stuff. But like to see how far matter. they come in three or four drafts, like it's really because all these mistakes you're talking about are like first draft things that go mm-hmm. away very quickly, and then yeah. you, you end up with these like incredible presentations at the end. Oh man! So I hate the fact that I always cross that out. And my other pet peeve is misused howevers. Mm. People use however because it sounds fancy and mm-hmm. because they don't know how to do another transition. <laughs> you know what's a better transition? And. <laughs> or but. Right? Yeah. He did this, but he didn't want to. Instead of, he did this, however, he re- would have preferred not to do it. <laughs> Is a much fancier way of just saying he didn't even wish he didn't have to. Yeah. Right? So I, of the, I think on one paper... Like, I actually kept track, and I deleted 18 howevers Mm -hmm. as I went through and replaced them with either nothing or a simple and, Mm -hmm. and it worked just as well, or a but. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, so here's my example of some surplusage that needs to be eschewed. Macbeth was very ambitious. 
This led him to wish to become king of Scotland. The witches told him that this wish of his would come true. The king of Scotland at this time was Duncan. Encouraged by his wife, Macbeth murdered Duncan. He was thus enabled to succeed Duncan as king. This was 51 words long. The other version. Encouraged by his wife, Macbeth achieved his ambition and realized the prediction of the witches by murdering Duncan and becoming king of Scotland in his place. 26 words means... And one sentence. And yep. one sentence. And easier, you know, I mean, it's fairly, both are fairly easy to understand, mm-hmm. but it's much less tedious for the reader, right? All you of said those, Macbeth three times, Duncan's name twice. Yeah. As a reader, all of that extra stuff, Didn't it, help. it bogs you down. It's like walking through snow, mm-hmm. right? The more garbage you have in your words and sentences and paragraphs, the harder it is for a reader to get your true thought out of it. The other reason why I think a lot of students write in that first way is because that is first draft thinking. Yes. Like yeah. you are trying to that. just get the ideas out and yep. you're just putting it on paper and then it's midnight and it's due tomorrow and you just, you, you print it off and you're done. But- Um, that second thing, like no one can really write that second sentence first First, time. You need to get the ideas down and then you need to go back and edit it for style. And, um, and the other thing is with, with, in terms of, of, of running a school or running an English classroom, those edits for style take a long time. And it means that you need to have them bring it. So it's almost like you need to have them turn in a first draft for ideas. Yes. And then make, give it back to them and say, your ideas are great. Re-edit this thing for style. And then they need to go back and re-edit it for style. Yeah, if I had process rules, it would be pick a format and stick to it. Mm-hmm. Both of these books talk about that. And also revise, mm-hmm. stink and revise. You you have to. I do my own writing and I will, I will find stuff I missed. I will find extra words that don't need to be there. I'll have to go through a couple of passes to delete stuff. And even then, I usually want to show it to somebody else because I'm too close to the project. Yeah. So no one's a perfect writer. Go and Mm -hmm. have it edited. This is why, and maybe I'll throw this out there because maybe there are people who are listening to this podcast who are educators who have done this. But my goal, one of the things that I want to do for writing next year is have the students email in a PDF draft of uh, of of their essay or whatever. And then, so here's the problem. You want to have, you want the students... If you just write all over a draft and hand it back to them, they will shove it in the bottom of their backpack and not care about it. Yep. If you sit down and talk to a student, even for five minutes, that ha- like they will listen and they will pretty much absorb it. We don't have time to do that for all these students. Um, so my idea is that for a couple of writing assignments, they email it in in a digital way, and I do a, like, a microphone and screen share, and I create a little video for every assignment, and I walk through it, and I edit it, and I email it to them, and then they have to watch that. And it's kind of like having a meeting with me. I'm going to try it next year. I don't know if it's going to work. If there's anybody out there who has ever done that as writing instruction, um, uh, let me know how that's worked and like things that you've learned about that because I think that could be a really cool way to um, help students work on their writing is to have these individual seminars with me that I can't do in class time, but I can do after class. I mean, I do a online. version of that in writing lab where we all write and then mm-hmm. I take two or three students and I put their writing up and then I say, here's how I would edit it. And here are the things that I would change. Here yeah. would have been my process. And here are the, so we, we look at it and we say, all right, what are the ideas? Can we say that more clearly? So we do that process a little bit, mm-hmm. but okay. So we got a, anyway, we keep, got a hall where keep on sure, do, you, do you want to do part two or we, we don't have that many left. Okay. Where we've already done, we're through rule four. So use active voice, put statements positively, use definite, specific, concrete language, eschew surplusage, which is a, <laughs> number four is, this is not an order of importance. Number four mm-hmm. is one of the most important and hardest to accomplish yeah. and requires a good vocabulary. Number five, prefer verbs to nouns. You will only find this one in Stone and Bell, but their point is that nouns tend to bog a sentence down, whereas verbs tend to make it move and make it do things. Mm -hmm. We're more interested in things that are acting and going somewhere rather than nouns. And so some examples. Uh, So another of Cormac's, McCormick's inventions was a mechanical corn picker. We could have said, Mr. McCormick also invented a machine for picking corn. Right. So in that sentence, he's inventing something. The machine is picking corn Mm. rather than saying it was a mechanical corn picker. So we have a tendency to name things and turn them into nouns rather than sticking with the verbs. But verbs make for much more interesting sentences Hmm. like uh, the subject of this book is low budget sports promotion techniques. 
So this is that. It's a linking verb and gives you a whole bunch of nouns, subject of this book, rather than this book tells you how to promote local sports mm. without spending much money. That's cool. Right, so I've the book is that. telling you something, and it tends to be a more dynamic sentence. Yeah. Things are doing things. It's just more fun to read. And we tend to just add nouns as things go on, right? Here, here's another example. The Allen Hamilton ship in connection represented for the proprietary, proprietary party a leadership comparable to that of the Pemberton-Logan-Norris combination of the Quakers, though the former exhibited less unity and effectiveness in politics. Huh. So we have 10 nouns uh, in addition to six proper names or five nouns for each of the sentences, two verbs, two verbs. That is paltry. Here is a better version. Um, Allen, Hamilton, and Shippen served the proprietary party much as Pemberton, Logan, and Norris served the Quakers, but were less unified and less effective politically. So they did this yeah, and were less effective. To, and that's just even a lot easier to understand just listening. Yeah, yeah it's, it's much easier. So here's, here's another one with a bunch of nouns. There has necessarily been a tendency on the part of researchers to continue studies with equipment now approaching obsolescence. Lots of nouns. As rewritten, it is, researchers have necessarily gone on using obsolete equipment. Yeah. It's way better. Yeah. Right? The more we try to pack it with nouns and name things, the more it tends to bog us down. And... It's like you, you're walking through a like a like a crammed attic. Mm -hmm. Like it's just there's furniture everywhere. Yeah, it, it you just you just get bogged down. And this one comes with kind of a kind of a corollary that you should prefer the active verb to a linking verb. Mm. So instead of our conclusion is that taxes must be increased by ten percent, say we propose to increase taxes ten percent. So instead of this is that equalizing something, say we are doing this. Yeah. Like we have decided on a 10% tax increase, even more forceful is we propose, right? So see the difference between this is a thing, this is a thing, here are some things. I can say, I'm doing this, the things are doing this, we are all taking action, and it makes for much more dynamic writing. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing. All right, so that's number five. I'm going to try to hustle through these last few. Number six is prefer the personal to the impersonal. If you can, put people in your sentences. It, it's just like with pictures, yeah. right? A picture of the sunset is interesting. A picture with the sunset and one of your best friends with her fingers up her nose is a much more interesting picture. We tend to like things with people in them. So it was necessary to get some sleep. That's passive. It's, I mean, it's not that great. The boys had to get some sleep. It's better. The drug would be lethal if it were swallowed. The drug would kill anyone who swallowed it. So that one has people in it. What was the casualty count versus how many people were hurt, right? The, mm. Putting people in your sentences makes them weightier, right? It just makes them more fun to read. How about the leadership was completely replaced last summer? Uh, that's kind of sterile. What about the leaders were all replaced last summer? Yeah. Well, there's people in it. We fired our boss. Yeah. Mm. The, the, we, we fired the boss because he was terrible. Mm. The medical profession considers the practice unsafe. Doctors... Doctors. Doctors consider the practice unsafe, right? So putting people in your sentence makes it more interesting. Yeah. The police department soon had the crime wave under control. The police soon had the, the crime wave under control. It just makes it more fun. Yeah. So prefer the personal to the impersonal. And the last one, number seven, uh, this is kind of implied in all the books, especially in rule number four, excuse sur surplusage, without being outright stated as a general rule, I think because it is so ubiquitous. And it's avoid intensifiers. <laughs> Intensifier meaning really, very, very, extremely, hugely. All of these... <laughs> you grinned at me like I had somebody in mind. No, yeah, I did. Sorry. Uh, I thought those all were. of these are ways to try to amp up a poor vocabulary. Yeah. Right? Is that really, really necessary? <laughs> Thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you could just say necessary. necessary. Usually what it does is... Uh, here, I'm going to read you about uh, the word really. It's an index of current usage at the end of Stone and Bell. Really is used by young writers either to persuade the reader of the intensity of their response, as in, I really love that dog, or to solicit his agreement to an argument for which no evidence is offered. We really made a mistake at Yale. Uh, invariably, the strategy misfires, and really comes through as a bankrupt effort to win the reader's respect or attention on the cheap. Good writers do not make this mistake. Mm -hmm. It takes more than an <clears throat> adverb to convey intensity of feeling or persuade the unpersuaded. 
Yeah, but yeah, this is the your adverbs again. don't move me. This is but they do. You guys, this speaking. is an extremely huge problem, <laughs> right? Yes, it ends up. Sound, it makes you sound immature. It makes you sound immature. It lands like it depends who says it. I, it, I mean, it I'm, sounds like pillows. Yeah. Why not just say this is a problem, mm -hmm. Magby? Mm -hmm. Doesn't that sound weightier than this is a huge problem? Or put a person in there and tell me how it's a problem for them. Yeah, yeah. give me an example. I, I'm not saying it's good writing. I'm just saying that it, it still can work. With yeah, in in what it doesn't, it doesn't instance, mean, sales, um, yeah, making this is a like, really good vacuum. Yeah, why not take it out? What's the other version? It's a good vacuum. This is, doesn't sound as good. This is a good vacuum. But you but you also said them both differently. I don't know. These are rules for writing, and I don't disagree with them as rules for writing. It's just I don't know. Yeah, I I can think of almost no instance where an intensifier aids the sentence rather than a. Why not say instead of a really good vacuum? Usually, this is a lack in vocabulary. You can say this is an excellent vacuum, or it excels others, or superior. Right? Excellent, superior, better than really good. Mm -hmm. Usually, what an intensifier is doing is making up for a lack of vocabulary. You don't have the right word, so you have to try to prop up the worse one with some extra intensifiers. Yeah. Or you don't want to. But the other is not wanting to look pretentious to someone. If you come off as um, trying to look better than the other person, like. Using an intensifier means that it's simpler language you're using, so you're not, um, what's the word for that? Being pretentious. Yes, but you can use, like, who doesn't know the word excellent? Or this vacuum is better than theirs, mm -hmm. right? I'm still saying something concrete. Mm -hmm. I'm saying I'm putting people in my sentence, and I'm making a claim about the competition, yep. all of which are better than, this is a really good vacuum. It's a quality vacuum. Yeah. Right? Like that's quality. I there you know. go. I feel like that's not a pretentious. I mean, I think the vacuum sucks. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Anyway. Uh, good. And there's some other rules that come along. I don't think they're that's as important. Uh -huh. Express well coordinate ideas in similar form. Well <laughs> Keep related words together as in avoid confusing constructions. Keep to one tense and summaries. Put the emphatic word at the end. There's all sorts of extra little rules, but I think those are my seven big ones. Use active voice, put statements in positive form, use definite concrete language, eschew surplusage. Prefer verbs to nouns, which is a tough one. Prefer the personal to the impersonal, put people in your sentences, and avoid intensifiers. If you do all of these things, which, by the way, usually happen only in revisions, yep. Yep. right? It is right. hard to write this way first time through. Yeah. You can only do it upon coming back through and cleaning up your ideas. Which is probably why your instinct of, well, this happens in sales. It's your first this, time Because it's it. your first time, because it's a conversation, yep. and yep. you don't get to go and revise it. Nope. So I noticed that you sometimes... You sort of fall into it. Yep. It is still easy to use the fact that when you're thinking sure. because you you are trying you to need put together second. the idea. You need the second. Yeah. So anyway, those are my rules for writing. If you're interested, uh, go get the books, man. They're super good. And I don't think that there are many copies of Pro Style out there. Mm -hmm. So it's jump on them fast because yeah. Amazon yep. will sell them out. I've, I had a hard time finding them. I was given mine as a gift and yeah. uh, it's because they're hard to find. But Strunk and White's Elements of Style, you can find they're everywhere. everywhere. They're like pennies. Mm -hmm. You can have a thousand of them if you want. So anyway, there you go. That's my rules for writing. Well, Hannenberg, thank you. I feel like I need to rewrite the intro <laughs> to uh, yep. Classical Stuff You Should Know, which I will not do right now. Oh. Um, do we have any oh, commonplace books? I do. And it's <laughs> from Chesterton about this very subject. Let's oh, hear awesome. it. Okay. So this is from Chesterton's book, Orthodoxy. He says, if you say... The social utility of the indeterminable sen indeterminate sentence is recognized by all criminologists as a part of our social sociological evolution towards a more humane and scientific view of punishment. You can go on talking like that for hours with hardly a movement of the gray matter inside your skull. <laughs> but if you begin, I wish Jones to go to jail and Brown to say when Jones shall come out, you will discover with a thrill of horror that you are obliged to think. <laughs> the long words are not the hard words. Yeah. It is the short words that are hard. There is much more metaphysical subtlety in the word uh, darn. We'll say darn, Thank you. but it's the other word, than in the word degeneration. Mm. So that's Chesterton on the same subject. Mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah. I mean, he's also making a theological point by using the other word, which may be the other word, which darn doesn't capture, but anyway. Right. Um, well, thank you for listening. You can find us on uh, classicalstuff.net. You can email us at classicalstuff at veritasacademy.net. You can tweet at us at coolstuff at twits, <laughs> at twitters. Yep, nailed it. Um, twote I really Raven. hope that's what they call their Every employees. Time. All twits. right, twits, gather up. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And then thank you for those who are, who are sending us stuff. It's great to hear from you. Yep. Um, if you have fun writing tips that we missed, please feel free to email them in. Um, don't be shy emailing them in. We will not judge your writing of your emails. Or <laughs> oh, if we, I was going to return to Mark Twain's like top writing clues. If you just Google it, like mm-hmm. Mark Twain writing tips, they're all they kind of all copy each other, but they are pulled from his writings and even from James Fenimore Cooper's literary failings. Cool, cool. Yeah. So, thank you listeners. This is Classical Stuff You Should Know signing off. I'm Graham here with AJ and Thomas saying bye. I'm right. really, really grateful you listened. <laughs> See right, you later. Right well. Right well.